All right. So, uh, actually, I wanted today, before <coughs> going to the next topic, which will be harmonic oscillator, so today I wanted to help you a little bit with the homework <coughs> that was given, because I realized maybe not everything uh, or not everyone is familiar with some of the some of the mathematical tricks that uh, are involved in this uh, homework number six, which is due next Wednesday, right? And uh, one point I want to emphasize is about it's all the problems about variational approach and uh, and in the number four, and that's the problem we kind of considered before. H lin, it's the particle in the box potential with uh, linear potential, it's still one particle, and the potential is like alpha x or infinity x is outside of the box, and x is within the box. Right, so this type of the problem, considering alpha is uh, less than zero, right. that's inclined bottom, and the uh, kinetic energy is just the usual kinetic energy for a single particle. Now, <coughs> the question. Number three asks you to build all the matrix elements. Oh, actually, there are only four matrix elements for this Hamiltonian. Uh, let's put I, put J here. I and J are one, two. And then these functions are just a normal particle in the box functions. And set of I, let me use J so that you won't confuse that with um, imaginary unit. <laughs> okay, so these these are our basis functions. This is matrix elements uh, H, I, J that are needed to solve the variational problem where our function, the approximation to the true solution is given like uh, C1 times phi1 plus C2 phi2. And uh, we established at the previous lecture that if you, if you make uh, energy as a function of this C1 and C2 that comes from the putting the this construction for the wave function into the expression for energy, right? So if you do that, and if you try to formulate the problem that will minimize this energy, right? Because, uh, well, generally this is the extremum condition, right? For any i goes from, we have two i's, one and two. All right, so if you do that, then you get equations which will be in the matrix form like this. So you have a matrix, you multiply it by a vector, it gives you the same vector multiplied by a constant. So that's a, a linear algebra or yeah, linear algebraic formulation of the same idea of eigen uh, well, function, right, or eigen vector in this case for the matrix of the operator, right? So that's what we end up with. Now, do you guys know how to multiply vector by a matrix or matrix by a vector? You know, right? So that's what is happening here, and what will be the result when you multiply two by two matrix by one by two 
a two by one uh, vector. So you get what? You you get uh, this after this multiplication. If you can put it in this short notation, where double underline is kind of defined that this is I'm talking about matrix. This is a vector, and then you have uh, at the end some kind of other vector. And the non-trivial condition here is that that other vector is essentially the same vector multiplied by a constant, right? So that's non-trivial statement that if you have a matrix multiplied by a vector, you get the ve another vector which is just a constant multiplied by a vector, which is the same as we started with. All right, so this is clear. And now how do we solve this problem? Uh, the one way uh, is just to put everything on the left-hand side, right? And you can always present this as a constant multiplied by identity matrix vector. And this will be diagonal matrix. Right, and now all that is needed to just make you comfortable with uh, writing this like if we put the right hand side now to the left, it will be like this equal to zero zero vector. Right. So that's the idea. This is the kind of equation which is equivalent, completely equivalent to the one that we formulated. And now the question is how do we how do we solve this problem? Because we want to have C1 and C2, which are if you square them, give you one, not something zero. Uh, or if they if you allow them to be complex, then it's actually the absolute values squared should be 1. So they should be non-zero. And uh, the only linear algebra tells us that the only way to, to have something non-zero here is that the determinant of the matrix that we are multiplying this vector, that determinant must be zero. If it's non-zero, then that means we have two equations and they are completely independent and the only way to get zeros here is to have this C1 and C2 being zero, right? So there is no other way. Uh, and that trivial solution that C1 equals C2 equals zero, it's not really interesting for us because if we I'd well, kind of take that solution, then this function will be just having a zero norm. This is not interesting, and that's why we cannot accept such solution. That's why we need this matrix to be so-called rank deficient that uh, corresponds to the condition that determinant of this matrix is zero. And that uh, condition gives us uh, non-trivial solutions for the coefficients, essentially. So that's the idea that uh, is usually studied in linear algebra courses. But uh, if you haven't studied that before, I'm just saying it now. And uh, the question that will be important for successful so solution of the item four is, do you guys know how to calculate determinant? Do you? Everyone? Right, let me just confirm your knowledge. So determinants uh, of, like, you can calculate determinant is actually quite, quite interesting function of the matrix. And it can be taken only for square matrices. We have here square matrix, right, two by two. And uh, the way, there is a general way of calculating determinants. And there is a kind of, uh, 
way to calculate mnemonic rule to calculate determinants of 2 by 2 and 3 by 3. And now for the 2 by 2, it's very simple. And now let, let me just uh, tell it to you. Uh, it's, um, you take the diagonal elements, you multiply them, and you subtract of the uh, product of the off diagonal elements, right? So then we have H11 minus E and H22 E minus uh, then H12 times H21. So this must be zero. As you can see, if you know all the H's, right, then this equation gives you a quadratic equation uh, essentially of the type. Right, so where a, b, and c, they are some functions of uh, h11, h22, and h12, h21, right? So then you know how to solve quadratic equations. And from that, uh, that quadratic equation, you can get two solutions that will correspond to the ground state and the ex first excited state for the energy, right? So, and that's pretty much the item four of the of the homework six that you need to just formulate uh, what the energies are, what the eigenenergies are, and uh, in terms of uh, matrix elements that you will hopefully find in item three of the homework, right? So this should be pretty straightforward. Now, determinant is an interesting function for the following reason, actually. And it's not like, do you guys know the kind of geometric meaning of determinant? If, say, you have two vectors, let's, let's, let's make it simple. Two vectors, uh, say, u and v in the 2D space. And then you, of course, will have uh, in some basis the coordinates of the, say, say some orthonormal basis, x and y, you have coordinates of these two vectors, ux, uy, and vx, vy. Now you can make a matrix out of these coefficients, right? So you have two vectors, and each has two uh, coordinates. So you can make two by two matrix. If you calculate determinant of that matrix, what is the geometrical meaning of this? It is the area, right? So how do we calculate areas of, uh, for the vectors? So the simple case would be when the vectors are orthogonal, right? And uh, one, say, would be only having the ux part, and another would be only having the y part, right? So, and the corresponding other component would be zero, right? So in this case, we know if it's, this is ux and this is vy, right? So what will be the area of this uh, rectangle, right? So what, what will be the area? Yeah, but even like the reason I, I made it so simple so that even without using determinant, you can tell me for this case, what should be the answer? It's ux times vy because everything is orthogonal. You multiply the height by the width, right? And so that's the answer. Now, this was a simple case where you don't even need determinants, but determinants work as well, right? Now, the true power of determinant then is in the situations where you actually have these extra components and you are ending up with situation like this or more complicated like, like this, right? So you are building parallelogram. And what is the area here now? How do you determine that? So vectors are not orthogonal. How do you calculate? But say you know the components and the determinant does nicely this job of essentially removing linear dependency. Why do I say we remove linear dependency? Because if the vectors are collinear with respect to each other, right? So if, if they have just, uh, if just one can be obtained as a 
constant multiplied by another, that those are linear dependent vectors. Essentially, they, they don't uh, give you more information. You can use one vector to obtain another, right? So they, they're just not spanning the space. They're, they're just along one line, essentially. And of course, the area uh, for these two vectors is zero, right? So, but they can be arbitrarily long, so that length doesn't translate into the area because they are linearly dependent, right? So the smaller the angle here between them, the closer they are to be aligned, and then the closer the area to zero. So essentially, these components, they can be large, but if there is a linear dependency, then determinant will be just zero. Uh, linear dependency would correspond to the situation where, say, they have only x-coordinate and the y-coordinate of both is zero, then you can obtain this by multiplying it with vx divided by ux constant, right? And so determinant of such uh, matrix is naturally zero because you multiply things by zero, right? And, uh, and that's, that's the meaning of determinant. But, of course, uh, like using elementary geometry, you can probably address this problem, right? Uh, with triangles and other theorems, but the true power of determinants is that they can they can be generalized to n-dimensional case. So you can have uh, three vectors in a three-dimensional space, and you can build kind of real three-dimensional volumes. And the determinant of three-dimensional vector x, uh, say you have vector u, vector v and vector omega, uh, w, right? And they, in three dimensions, they have three components, right? So then v, w, okay? And you can calculate determinant, and that determinant will be volume. Again, if any of these two will collapse to one line, then it will be a surface, right? And the surface volume is zero because it's infinitesimally uh, thin, right? So nicely, determinants can take the concept of uh, surface, volume, and volume in n-dimensional space, and as long as your vectors, well, as long as you're working with vectors, so they have components, you can put the components in the matrix. You need n components for n-dimensional case, uh, or sorry, n, n vectors for n-dimensional case, and then you can calculate the volume of that, of the space that's encompassed by those vectors. Unfortunately, this fact is not really emphasized much in the, in the calculus, because when we do calculus and we do multidimensional integrals, uh, if you want to change the coordinate system from one coordinate system to another, then... Uh, there is a Jacobian matrix that will appear, and it, the determinant of that Jacobian matrix is essentially the way, say, to go if we do integral over uh, our normal space, dx, dy, dz, we will get the integral over, say, uh, spherical coordinates that we will consider in the case of a hydrogen atom. Right, so there are like spherical coordinates where it's a radius and two angles, and there is a determinant of the matrix that essentially does the job of recalculating the volume that is built in this integral by elementary dx, dy, dz coordinates. And in this coordinate system, we have different elementary vectors, and in order to recalculate uh, elementary volumes, you need to account for the fact that the vectors are different, right? So, and the built volumes on those. Uh, elementary vectors, they, uh, like volume here will be that volume multiplied by extra term, which will have uh, partial derivatives of uh, dx over dr, and then dx over d phi, and other. Essentially, you have all mixed derivatives, and that, that's the matrix that you need to uh, calculate determinant for uh, to obtain the Jacobian. So that's, we will we'll return to this topic more, but, uh, but the idea of the determinant is, uh, it's first of all, it has very clear geometrical meaning, and it helps to 
it helps to identify where the vector, when vectors are linearly dependent and uh, in the matrix. And that's what we are actually interested in in this case, because if uh, vectors are not linearly dependent, then multiplying by arbitrary vector will never give us zero vector. OK, so hopefully with this information, it will be enough to solve the problem I gave in the homework. Um, just to finish the, the determinant topic, I would like to give you, uh, for those who don't know, how do we calculate determinant of, say, 3 by 3 matrix and uh, n by n in general, right? So if you have a matrix A, which is equal to A11, uh, actually, I will give you, um, yeah, let's, let's consider a more general case, 1, 2, and so A1, N, A2, 1, A, N, 1, A2, 2, A, N, N. Right, say we have this N by N matrix, and we want to calculate determinant of A. It turns out oh, what we can do is we just go by, say, row or column, doesn't really matter. So say we go from by the first column, oh, sorry, row, and uh, we go element by element, and the process is the following. Say it's A11 to the power of minus 1, and then sum of uh, its indices, 1 plus 1 is 2, so the power is uh, uh, even. And this, this must be multiplied by what is called uh, minor of the matrix. So when we remove the column and the row corresponding to this uh, element, we create the matrix of the size n, small, n minus 1 by n minus 1. Okay? And we want to multiply a11 by this uh, sine factor and multiplied by determinant of this smaller matrix, essentially. That starts with A22, goes up to A2n, right? And here it goes up to N2, and here Nn, right? Now, then we go to the next element, and A12, and we cross out its column and its um, row. First, I will show you a couple of terms, and then I will uh, kind of explain why why is this the kind of sensible way of doing things, and why does it kind of work. So we again put in a minus uh, a one two minus one. Now power is one plus two, one plus two is three, and minus one into the third power is minus one. And we need to multiply it. Now, the determinant will be the, the matrix that we obtain by uh, just crossing the row and the column. And it's, again, n minus 1 matrix, but it's a different one. It starts here, a2, 1, goes all the way to a, n, 1. And the next term will be a2, 3, a, n, 3. Right, go all the way to a two n a n n, right? So again, this matrix is n minus one, n minus one, and so on and so forth. So we go by the first row, and we are finishing at a one n with minus one one plus n times the determinant of uh, matrix which is n one n minus 1 by n minus 1. And you can construct that uh, smaller matrix by, again, removing the row and the column. And the matrix will be now this, right? So you see the, the process. And why is this a process to calculate the determinant? Because we started with n by n matrix. And we reduced it to some expression that involves only n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrices. Now we can use it again for every minor matrix, right? Uh, 
the same process will reduce it to some expressions which involve n minus 2 by n minus 2. And when we grind everything to the numbers, then the determinant of the number is just a number. Okay? So that's how it works for 2 by 2. We take this, it's a 1, 1 element, so it's positive. And then the minor is determinant here, which is just that number. Now we go to this element, 1 plus 2 is third power, and minus 1 in the third power is negative. That's why the, and the minor of that matrix is this one. So again, we just, get, we just have number, um, and the, the sign in front of that product is negative. Right? So that's how 2 by 2 is calculated, but you can do it. You can continue and do 3 by 3, 4 by 4. Of course, the number of terms, do you guys know how, the, how many terms when you, you, will you get if you consider determinant of n by n matrix? N terms. Huh? N terms. No, even in this, even in the first uh, kind of, in the first iteration, we have n terms. Yeah, yeah. One, one term. How many terms do we have two by two? One, or two. Two terms, right? Now with three by three, now with three by three, uh, let's see, we know how, how it's gonna be once we get to the two by two, right? So with 3 by 3, we will generate three terms, right? Three terms uh, that will each contain the 2 by 2 minor, right? And, uh, and then the, oh, uh, yeah, factorial. and factorial, that's right. So essentially, it's very quickly growing. Uh, so it's not equal, determinant of the matrix is not equal to n factorial, uh, but rather it has n factorial terms. If you calculate through this explicit expression, uh, which is unpleasant, of course, because uh, <laughs> the factorials, they, they grow very quickly, right? And uh, of course, no one calculates determinants by, by this procedure numerically. What they usually do, they diagonalize matrix, and, uh, and essentially, uh, determinant of diagonal matrix is uh, it's just a product of diagonal elements, okay? And, uh, but there is a theorem that says that when you diagonalize the matrix, uh, essentially you transform the basis so that the matrix becomes diagonal, uh, that transformation can be made so that uh, it will not affect determinant. Okay, so that's why determinant of initial matrix is equal to the determinant of diagonal matrix that you obtain at the end. You can actually check that in this problem uh, by, uh, by, well, cons uh, by obtaining these values E's and uh, that's essentially that E1, E2 is diagonal representation of matrix uh, H11, H12, H21, H22. So if you calculate determinant of this, calculate determinant of this, uh, they will be the same. That's an interesting fact. Okay? All right, so now you know how to calculate determinants. You can use them to solve variational problems where, yeah, we use, um, uh, say, representation of the wave function was here. <laughs> was a representation of the wave function as linear combination. And then the solution of time-independent Schrodinger equation ends up being just a algebraic problem, which is a, a eigenvalue problem on the matrix. And uh, it can be solved uh, relatively effectively. Now, the, the only trouble is that uh, applying variational approach through this linear combinations, more terms you have in this linear combination, three, four, five, the, the dimensionality of this matrix will grow 
to like from two by two to three by three, four by four, five by five. So it, it grows very quickly, yeah. right? And um, in realistic problems, if you want to solve, uh, say, for the molecules with the spectroscopic accuracy, you'd need to use uh, billions by billions the matrices, and uh, then people don't even store those matrices in the computer memory because they're just so big. And there are interesting uh, approaches. How do you solve this uh, linear algebra problem of eigenvalue, uh, getting eigenvalues without constructing the matrix, but rather uh, constructing it on the fly when, when it's needed? Okay, So there's a big computational uh, problem here if you want to apply this uh, relatively straightforward approach. Now, one last thing uh, I want to say today is uh, I want to wanna show you an example where we are solving kind of similar problem, but using nonlinear approach. Uh, because uh, this variational approach can be used in linear form. Or we can say, all right, so what is, what if we, uh, and I have an example where let's just solve the problem that we know how to solve. We know the solution. So what we do, we take particle in the box, particle in the box problem with its potential, which is zero in the box. And... Uh, outside is infinite and uh, say if we don't know what the solution is right so we do that frequently when we try to learn new method or apply new method it's better to apply it first on the problem where you know the solution that that way you can control that you actually understand the new method right otherwise if it's too many changes you apply new for you method on the new problem you never know whether you you got the right result or the wrong result. You, you, do, you don't know what, what the result should be, right? So here we know what the answer should be in terms of energy, in terms of a wave function. And we, instead of doing phi uh, as a linear combination, we will write it like this. You know at this point, hopefully, that... Uh, this is a good function, right? Because it has zero at uh, x equals zero and it has zero at x equals l, right? So it can be anything in between, but it has uh, right boundary conditions. And we will consider this function only within the range zero l. And the question we're asking is what should be alpha that uh, minimizes the energy? Uh, well, in this expression, uh, phi, that depends on alpha. H, phi, depends on alpha. And then we have normalization, right? So our estimate of energy is essentially will be a function of alpha, right? Because we integrate x, but alpha stays. And we would like to minimize with respect to alpha. That way we'll get as close as possible to the ground state energy and we'll get the function that is as close to the ground state wave function also as possible. Okay, so that's kind of the idea to try something, something different. We could also potentially try something like this, right, and very alpha and beta, but that would be, believe me, a little bit more complicated because this way we get only one equation one variable, so it's more manageable than having two equations, both nonlinear. Now, who can tell me uh, what, approximately, what alpha should we expect? One. Why? Okay, well. Sure, but uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, what was else uh, given before? Uh, do you remember when the example with alpha equals 1 was given, we also 
consider uh, so this phi function if we write it down as a linear combination of particle in a box functions right the coefficients how did they behave um, they were like especially the one that n equals one coefficient uh, that coefficient was 99.99 uh, percent, right? So, or yeah, close to essentially it was 0 0.999. This C1 coefficient that that means really alpha equals one was very close. This this function x times x minus l is very close to the function which is n equals one function square root of two divided by l sine of uh, pi x divided by l, right? So these two functions. Uh, alpha equals 1 and n equals uh, 1, they are very close. If you plot them, you will see that. Uh, and that's why the coefficient is very close. In other terms, they contribute a little bit. So now we, we already know what the, what the right alpha approximately will be. But it's interesting how, what will the, uh, our variational problem will give us, right? And uh, yeah, that's essentially the, the question. What is the optimal alpha? It should be close to 1, but how close is it? And I will just, uh, so what do we need to know here is uh, essentially three matrix elements. It's, uh, it's matrix with all of this phi alpha, right? So we need to know average kinetic energy plus potential energy divided by essentially function itself, right? So these three integrals we will calculate. So average kinetic energy is the integral over dx, phi alpha x, uh, derivative phi alpha x, and then multiplied by minus h bar squared to m. So, and if you do the integral and do the differentiation and integral, right, so then the answer is the following. It's h bar squared divided by 2m alpha l 1 plus 2 alpha 4 alpha squared minus 1. Okay. So not very, you can, you can see already that there are some not pleasant terms appearing, like L into the power 1 plus 2 alpha. That because then we will need to differentiate that expression with respect to alpha, right? And equal it to 0 and find the alpha out of that, right? So we, we will need to write the expression, like we need to write the equation out of this uh, term, right? And so this is first. Now, the potential energy is a little bit simpler. Uh, no, it's uh, 1 plus alpha, L 1 plus alpha, 2, 2 plus alpha. OK, so this is a bit simpler. And then normalization, which is phi, phi integral in the denominator. That integral is also not very pleasant. It's L3 plus 2 alpha divided by 1 plus 2 alpha, 1 plus alpha, 2 alpha plus 3. Okay, You can do all these integrals because they, they're actually quite simple uh, since the function is so well, relatively simple. Right? Okay, so then the, the energy as a function of alpha becomes this expression h squared, essentially. Sum of the two terms, v and t divided by phi, and then alpha 2 alpha plus 3, 1 plus alpha. L squared. 
to alpha minus one. Two, two plus alpha. Okay, so that's the that's the expression. Okay. And we then differentiate with respect to alpha. Right, so these nasty terms with L into the power, they, they kind of nicely disappeared at the end when we did the, the ratio. And then, then we, we take the derivative. And after differentiation, uh, after differentiation, which I will not put here, and uh, assuming that L equals 1 and H bar equals 1 and the mass equals 1, right? So we kind of do this assumption so that uh, things will be simpler. Otherwise, uh, the equations that I will write right now, uh, they will not be solvable. So then you end up with the equation of the fifth power. 8 alpha into the fifth, 36 alpha into the fourth, uh, 38 alpha into the cube, uh, minus 11, minus 23 alpha squared, uh, minus 56 uh, alpha and all this equal to zero. So that's the equation we need to solve to obtain alpha. Numerically. Numerically, you can solve that equation. Now, <laughs> pretty much I'm showing this just to give you a sense of what sometimes quantum, relatively simple quantum mechanical problems can <laughs> can be and so you can see how well like what kind of methods can be used to solve them so just uh, how do we solve how do we solve the equation of the fifth power well it's not uh, there's no formal like quadratic equation right but there are ways to solve it numerically one of the simple ways and even you uh, guys can do it going home and do it uh, it's just go do the Excel spreadsheet, right, where you put the equation and you put the range of alphas. You know what the alpha, well, like where approximately alpha will be, right, close to one. So say you take from two to, what do I have? I have a range from minus three to one, all right? And then if this is alpha and this is the value of the function, uh, the function on the left-hand side, then it turns out that uh, the function looks like this. Okay, so it has, in this normal range, it has three roots. You can easily, well, just plot it in, with Excel. And this root is about minus three. This other root is, uh, let's say minus 0 0.5 and this root is close to 1 right so you zoom in do a different grid and keep keep making the grid of alpha points kind of finer and finer and then you can zoom in by doing that uh, as as far as you want right essentially and that is graphical solution of any algebraic equation or any equation by that matter, right? So you, you can have any function of alpha equals zero. You can plot that function and see where that function crosses the uh, alpha axis, right? So if you do that carefully, then the optimal alpha is going to be 1.0375. Okay, so it's indeed close to one. Uh, well, simply that uh, they, let's see, they are problematic for our boundary conditions. Oh. 
right? So the, if alpha is negative, then you may have problems in this, in this limit, right? Division by zero. Or uh, this one may be not as problematic as this one because, but still, pro no, it's still problematic because uh, yeah, both of them are problematic because uh, when when x approaches zero, this term becomes just minus l, but this term goes to infinity, right? So you know that the function must come back to zero, not to the infinity. So it's clear from the physical perspective that uh, there is only one root that satisfies our conditions for the boundary conditions. Okay. All right. So this is an example how we can use uh, nonlinear, nonlinear because uh, we kind of put in the parameter into the power, right, uh, of the wave function and optimize that with respect to that parameter. Okay, any questions? Yeah. So, so why is x to the power of uh, alpha and approaching infinity when the x are approaching zero? Because uh, the question this gentleman asked was about uh, two other roots. And two other roots is when this root close to minus 3. So that would make alpha optimal uh, equal to minus 3. And that would make function to be x to the minus 3 uh, L minus x. Right? This function is not physical because for our problem because when x approaches 0, this function would go skyrocket to infinity. Right, because x to the minus 3 is 1 over x cubed. So this would be 1 over 0. And we don't, don't want such uh, optimal alpha, right? So our optimal alpha should be positive. Otherwise, we'll get this problem with approaching 0. Okay? Any negative power would have this issue. Anything else? Okay then, I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>